Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to be looking at Peppermint OS 11 right after this. Peppermint 11 came out mm, about a couple of weeks ago, I think, or maybe a week ago. But it's a continuation in a 12-year-old history of this operating system or this distribution. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to, we're going to look at some of the goals that the original project had. We're going to look at a, the vision that Mark Greaves talked about that he had planned for next-gen Peppermint OS. We're going to do a little compare and contrast between... Peppermint 10 Respin, Peppermint 11, look at some of the differences, then bring it up, install it, and check it out for ourselves, and then make some final conclusions. I am also have conducted the benchmarks, and we'll be, maybe if I can, we'll maybe work those in today. We'll see how things go. This project started mm, probably sometime before 2010, because the first release of it came out in 2010, and it was a, a distribution that was put together by Shane Remington and Kendall Weaver. What their goals for the original Peppermint OS were was to find some way to create a lightweight distro, because remember, a lot of the distros at the time were pretty heavy, and still are, by the way. They wanted something quick, fast, responsive, but there was something new on the horizon that they saw coming, which was cloud computing. Now, that cloud computing could be public cloud. It could also be private cloud. But none of the distros prior to Peppermint OS had the ability to handle cloud applications. So they wanted to build something into this distribution that would permit that. Now remember, this is way before Chrome OS. This is a couple of years before Chrome OS even hit the uh, streets. I've heard a lot of people talk about this cloud distribution as... It's cloud only or it's cloud hybrid. No, it's none of those things. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Their approach to this is to provide the ability to integrate cloud applications at the same time allowing you to install applications from the traditional repo. But I did, I did see an interview that Mark Greaves had uh, shortly before his death. It was actually in November of 2019. And he talked about what his vision was for next-gen Peppermint OS. Now, Peppermint 10 Respin was about to drop or had dropped. Uh, in the, and so that was the last release that Mark Greaves was actually involved with. But he did lay out a vision for what he saw coming down the road. The first thing that Mark was concerned about was Canonical stated direction to move to LXQT, which they had done. But Canonical say, stated that they were moving from LXDE to LXQT. Wow, that's a pretty big leap. I mean, uh, so Mark was looking at rebasing the Peppermint OS on Zubuntu or Xbuntu in order to get away from this decision that Canonical had made. He knew that this there had to be a change. There was nothing that he could do about it. XFCE seemed to fit better with the goals of Peppermint OS and so because they had been using components from XFCE in the in the previous versions of Peppermint OS. The other thing was the the release schedule of Ubuntu is they're a big project. They have a lot of developers. They have a lot of people doing documentation and releases and testing. So they can afford to spin up a new release of it every six months. And so that's a little aggressive for a team the size of Peppermint OS. And so they wanted to just do new releases of Peppermint OS annually and then do respins as needed. That's pretty much what Mark said during the interview. He didn't say they would do respins every six months. He said as needed. But he still wanted a minimal install footprint and let. And his goal was let the user decide what they want. They are the only ones that really know what applications they like and need. So let's take a look at some of the differences between Peppermint 10 respin, which was the last release, and Peppermint 11. So the distribution baseline originally was 1804.2. Uh, the Peppermint 11, I've heard some people say it's Debian 11, but after looking at the actual sources list in, Debian, in uh, Peppermint 11, 
Unstable is listed there as well, but it's down at the bottom of the list. The other one is the desktop manager itself. It was kind of a hybrid that was built around Peppermint 10 Respin. It was LXDE, but it had elements of uh, XFWM4 and also the XFCE panel that appeared at the bottom of the screen. Whereas Peppermint 11 is consolidating all that into XFCE 4.16. The installer, I believe, was Peppermint on Peppermint 10 was Ubiquity, and they are moving it to Calam Calamari's. There was some install options under Peppermint 10 for 32-bit or 64-bit, and the Peppermint 11 team has chosen to move like almost all of the major distributions to a 64-bit only uh, release. File manager is Nemo on both sides, so no big change there. File browser on Peppermint 10 is Firefox 96 after the update. Peppermint 11 hasn't anything installed. App containers. Uh, Peppermint 10 had built-in support. Now, flat packs and snaps were installed by default. They were ready to go out of the box. As far as Peppermint 11 is concerned, there's nothing particularly installed. Of course, app images it would, would be trivial to get going. But there are some steps you have to do in order to get flat packs to run and some steps you need to do into it to install snaps if you want them. Also, the web uh, single site browser is uh, the uh, is based on ICE and that and the older releases supported Firefox, Chromium and Vivaldi. And I believe a patch came out later that added support for Chrome. Those four browsers are supported on, on Peppermint 11 as well. So if you want to create application-based links to website to single websites, you can do that, so using ICE. Online Guide um, is, pre is present in Peppermint 10 Respin, and there is an ICE tutorial, but otherwise there is not an online guide. I mean, if you go to the website, it's for the older release. There is an online forum, however, that will help you, and there was a SSB, a web SSB, that was created for you on uh, Peppermint 10. You'll find that link now in the Welcome to Peppermint app. So if you want access to the forums, you can gain access to them from that. Peppermint 10 Respin had the ability to install NVIDIA drivers through the, if you chose the third party during the install. So Peppermint 11 being Debian based, Debian has a different philosophy when it comes to proprietary. So they do not include them by default. However, the Peppermint 11 provides the repos that you need in order to install that package. So if you want to install the NVIDIA package, you can. Now, the latest release of the kernel on Peppermint 10 Respin after the last update is 5.4. I think it originally was 5.0 when it initially came out. And now... Peppermint is on, of course, Debian, which is 5.10. So I guess that at this point, I think what we need to do is just give this thing a look. So let's go ahead and bring up the install. And this is Calamari's, and I'm, yeah, I'm, in the, I'm American English, of course. That's good. My location is, is, near, is in the time zone of Chicago. It's not near it. Uh, and then my keyboard is U.S., and then we'll do an erase. We're all good to go. A confirmation on what's going to happen here. It's got my time zone, the keyboard, partitions are set up, and we'll go ahead and tell it to install. And this will take a little bit, and we'll we'll let it run through, and I'll, I'll kind of pause things here. It's uh, 12.58. Uh, there you go. He was a team leader since Peppermint 6. Fairly fast uh, in the install process, so I'm going to go ahead and click Done and leave that checked, and then it should... And so the first thing you're greeted with is the Welcome to Peppermint app. This is the forum button. Now this is where you can choose your web browser that you are missing. Because you'll notice here, if I go over to the internet, there's only ICE that's installed here. There's no web browser at all. So I'll go ahead and put that out. There's some extras here you can install, like themes and icons and, and all of the wallpaper that they have ever had. Uh, yeah, one of the things about Peppermint o OS is they do have some really great wallpapers. So uh, if you want that, uh, you can do that. I'm not going to do that today. There's a tutorial on how to use ICE on setting up site-specific browsers. So what I'm going to do... Um, I'll show you how to do that right now. So if I want to create a, a, a web single site browser, I can go here. Uh, I can give it a name. Let's say, let's call it 
YouTube. And maybe it might even be someone's particular, maybe there's a particular channel that you like. Uh, and then you can click this. You can either select an icon or use whatever's in the web server's fave icon. All right, so I did find it. So I'll go ahead and apply that. And then it cycles around to allow you to do it again. So you can keep adding them. And then when you come back here to the menu and go to Internet, you'll see YouTube's right there. I'll click on that. It should bring up Firefox ESR and take me to the YouTube homepage. So, 78. So, yeah, that's pretty old. Yeah, that's, that's pretty out of date. So you can see that it starts out with the main repo. Security repo is next. Updates repo. Bullseye backports and unstable is right here. So the order of this is it's going to come down through the main repo and look for if I'm installing Firefox ESR, look here. And then it'll go it'll traverse down to this one and find any security repos which I don't quite I mean it's already found one here when I'm installing Firefox so it doesn't go any further. Once it finds a match it stops. If that package were were not in the main uh, stable repo, it would have dropped through to this, and then it would have found the security update, which has 96 in it. But it doesn't work like that. And so it'll just keep going down through the list until, like if it's a package that is not in here, until it does find one. But what we are really interested in is right here in preferences. This is called a uh, APT pinning. And the way this works is in here are are your files for pinning. So you got 90. We'll look at one right here. So what this is doing is, uh, in this particular case, it is saying all packages uh, pin the release, but I think this would be pin it to stable and give that the highest priority. Uh, if it's a priority 10, that is, if it's not in this one, then look here for the packages. So if you wanted to always look at the unstable, I, I wouldn't recommend doing that. But if you wanted to always look at the unstable versions, you could just write unstable there, put stable there. And then once you did a massive update, <laughs> bring all of those packages in to replace those. And your results may be catastrophic when you do that. I mean, you could blow yourself right out of the water. Um, yeah, that's usually a bad idea. One of the things that I look for when I'm doing pinning, this is the danger part of it, is if you notice that when you're going, after you've set up pinning for a particular, and you can set this up for a particular package, and that's what we're going to do today. So I'm going to set up, um, let's, let's do Firefox here. Uh, ESR. And so I, what, what I'm going to do is set up the pinning, but one of the things I look for when I'm doing an install and I have pinning enabled for an app is if it installs lib6c, stop. Don't, 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 <laughs> that's just my, my advice. I mean, that's a rule of thumb. It's not an absolute, but generally if, if you're pulling lib6d from another repo other than the one that the kernel was built on, yeah, you're going to be a world of hurt, potentially. So, All right, so what we want to do is we want to create a file that has uh, two entries in it, essentially. These are entries. So that first one is entry. This is an entry. So I, you can have this be a star if you want all the packages to be affected. So in other words, you want bullseye security to replace all the packages. It's probably not a good idea. But what you really want to do is, in this case, for just Firefox ESR, I want to pin the release to uh, the bullseye-security repository. I'm giving this a priority of 900. So if there is any other things in here or in the preferences that are, are maybe overlaying this, that this would have maybe a higher priority than the others. Then this is the package that it normally would be in, <clears throat> which would be the bullseye stable. This has a lower priority, so if it's not in here it will go here, you get, and then we'll do an APT update. And I should see a package now, and if I do an APT list, 
you can see that, yeah, it's got a version 91 for the Firefox ESR, and it's coming from stable security. So that means my, my preferences, my pinning is working. So at this point, I can go back to my home directory and go ahead and do an upgrade as normal. Now, I am not going to just let this go because I want to make sure that I'm not upgrading any other packages that are going to have side effects on my system. So don't just let this go and not pay attention to it. <laughs> Or you could blow yourself right out of the water. Trust me, been there, done that. Got the t-shirt. So, uh, all right. So, everything's good now. So, I should be able to go here. Should be able to go to internet. It's now. Good. Well, I already know this is a new one because it's asking me for the theme. So, we'll go ahead and give it one. We'll save it. And this time, we should be at 91. 91.5. So you can, you can use either technique uh, if you prefer to use uh, Esnick's uh, technique for doing this. He, he just makes sure that the APT sources list has security, uh, bullseye security, in it, and then he passes a minus T. I'm lazy. I don't want to do that because then I'll forget to put that minus T in and point it to there. So I just pin it, which is essentially the same thing. It's essentially putting that minus T in there for you. So... Yeah, for just that package. So, yeah, you could, you know, you could inadvertently replace something out of the unstable if you wanted to, too. So, yeah, or maybe maybe you wanted to do that on purpose. I don't know. You know, one thing I said I was going to do, let's do it. Let's reboot this so we can actually get a good account of how much how much memory it's actually taking on the start versus how much I'm loading up into the app caches. I'm not, I mean, I know some of you guys are a lot, really concerned with how much memory your distros take. I'm not. I don't really care less. Uh, memory's one of the cheapest things you could buy. Even even with the prices right now, it's still the cheapest thing. Well, let's take a look. So, yeah, 417 meg. Now, the granted, LXDE was about half that, about 350 meg or so. Uh, and, but... But here's the thing. There were more tasks running under LXDE than there is under XFCE. So I guess it really depends on what you consider as light. Look at this. I mean, it's hardly touching the processor at all. You got 67 tasks running, 130 threads running. Maybe that's high to you. That's not high to me. I think it was 80 plus on, on Peppermint 10 Respin. I think it was around 80. Uh, the other thing we need to do is, let's see, do we have get? Probably not. Get clone, HTTPS. Let's just go ahead and check it. Uh, I got to do my due diligence, right? Just to see what it's like out of the box. I'm going to guess around 66, something like that. Oh, no, this is interesting. Skipping uh, tells you what tests it skipped, 64. Yeah, so that's been pretty much, uh, I don't think this is any different, but let's take, yeah, there's a lot, a lot to do. Yeah, nice. No, no, uh, this is a plus. It's not complaining about the firewall issues. Like, you should install one. Um, that all looks the same. Now, I'm sure that this new version probably has added more pickiness. Uh, as far as the amount of disk space, we should do that. It is taking 6.4 gig. That's, yeah. Well, I, you know, I've, I have been, I put Office out here, so I should have really looked at it before I did that. And so... But I guess this would put it in comparison with others. I already know they have this identified as Peppermint OS because it showed that. And in this, it showed the logo. So, okay. So one of the things that you know, I came away from when when uh, EB was was uh, reviewing this, and by the way, EB is a good friend, and so is Esnix. Um, 
you know, he <laughs> English Bob has a tendency to, to uh, um, I don't know. It, I don't know if it's overstating or just. Uh, there, he was obviously disappointed by it, but I, I'm not. I'm not disappointed by this at all. Engineers love change. I mean, I understand after going back and figuring out, you know, what was going on, what was some of the challenges that Mark Greaves was going to face with the next release, uh, Peppermint OS. There was no choice. They had to do something. They had to move off, or they were going to be stuck with L LXQT. So, yeah, I mean, nobody likes change in the user community, but the engineers don't mind. It gives us something to do, right? I mean, that's that's what we live for is uh, if we don't have any change to make, then, yeah, we sit around twiddling our thumbs, and that makes for a very boring job. I like what they're doing. I like what the direction they're going here. Is this operating system perfect? No, of course not. No, no distribution is perfect. They all have quirks and warts and problems, and, uh, yeah, I mean... That's part of the fun, right? I mean, that's what we, I mean, <laughs> would I use this? Heck yeah, I'd use this. I mean, I think it's great. And uh, they're trying to get away from the bloat. They're trying to get away from having all this stuff that's running in the background. And I'm, I'm glad to see this. Where did we end up today, I guess, is really the question. So the promise that I have for you with this is that we would look at Peppermint OS and look at the what was going on at the time that the design decisions were going into this release. What was important? What were some of the things that were going to be challenges for the development team going forward with or without Mark Greaves? And the problem was, as we saw, it was twofold. One, uh, the baseline release of 18.04 is running out of runway next April in 2023. That's the end of life for 18.04. And, and that means they drop support. So the other problem was LXDE. LXDE, uh, Canonical was migrating off of it and going to LXQT. Anytime you move from one desktop environment to another, that especially one that's based on a different set of libraries, yeah, that's going to create havoc for anything that you've written. I hope that you walked away learning something that you didn't know about Peppermint OS today. That was my goal and my the things that I wanted to impart to you. Second, you wanted to understand better what some of the challenges that the team was facing in going from Peppermint 10 respin to 11 and it didn't matter who was going to be at the helm. Third, did you did you see that it maintains its its original design goals? That it still has the elements of what it was originally designed to do, and I and I think it does. So with that, I salute you and see you next time. Bye for now.